Most arts and crafts furniture was designed by architect, who, architects who use furniture design as a way to supplement their income, but oftentimes they are actually designing specific pieces of furniture for a specific space, which is a little bit different than what we're used to. Oftentimes furniture historically has been intended to fit in a space, but you can move it from place to place. Arts and crafts is not always like that. You can move it, but should you? Now, when we're dealing with arts and crafts, we have a lot of people getting involved. Uh, for example, Ford Maddox Brown. Now, he's a pre-Raphaelite artist. He's primarily a painter, but he's known for creating these incredible stained glass windows. And what he's doing is he's going to produce pieces that were designed for the middle class, for the average person as he saw it, not just stained glass, but also furniture pieces. These are primarily pragmatic pieces, ornamented enough to really beautify a space in a simple way. We know, for example, this is Ford Maddox Brown because this arch top is mimicking the same arch used in the frames of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, uh, of which he's a member. But you'll see very simple panel construction. When there's curvilinear design, it's usually large, broad curves, comfortable curves. But most of the design is primarily rectilinear. Uh, we do have things like columns that stand out as small decorative elements. But again, they're small and minor elements on this piece. We will also see these very rectilinear chairs that he's going to create, oftentimes of turned ebonized wood with some kind of woven seat. And this shows a sense of both English and Asian style, the design of those uh, small turned pieces and their placement gives us almost a Japanese feel as if we're looking at a Japanese panel of some form, of course, very influential at the time. And the rectilinear form tells us that this is going to be arts and crafts. Even the lathe work in the legs, which is usually fairly ornate, here takes on a very pragmatic twist. There's no specific motif that we're picking out. And this piece that's holding the stretcher bars is, of course, much thicker. And then it, fine, it comes down to a fine point. It creates the sense of a very graceful, very strong, and yet sort of dainty chair. So these turned pieces are going to be really common, and they will be designed by people like uh, Ford Maddox Brown. One of the pieces that comes out of this period is going to be the Sussex chair. Now, these are important. All of these chairs are built without the use of screws or nails. They are only using exceptionally good joinery. That's part of what stands out about arts and crafts furniture. Now, the Sussex chair was a simple type, named for an area in which the chair had originally been made by a local carpenter. And it's designed again with that ebonized wood and rush seat. And there are going to be a number of variations. So here we see on the left a form with that curve in the back. Uh, very interesting sort of curve. Of course, that's going to be steam bent or laminated in some way, probably steam bent after being turned. We also see details that aren't necessary to the structure of the chair. They're purely aesthetic. For example, the sheer number of stretchers, the upright at the end of the arm passing through the seat, and down to the stretcher bar, the use of the spheres on the back matching uh, these finials on the ends of the chair. Now, we do see variations. For example, in this example, we have an adjustable back chair with an improvement in comfort and was derived from the basic Sussex chair, but also obviously mixed with some of those Jacobean ideas of reclining furniture. And typical of the period, the chair is again ebonized, 
And this one is actually designed by Philip Webb, the man behind the Red House. And it gives us that sense of something that's been beautified just enough to give it an aesthetic appeal. But he's looking at the larger, broader lines rather than looking at adding small ornamentation. We see the same thing in our more basic Sussex chair over here. And the decoration is typically arts and crafts with the use of fairly realistic flora and fauna. Now, from this period, we will also see the development of the Morris chair, named for William Morris, of course, again, key to the ideas of arts and crafts. And the reason I bring this up is he's going to bring it up. He's going to create the design for this very simple, yet usually very heavy, quarter sawn and usually white oak chair. And it's something that you're going to see a lot in the United States. And it's got a lot of commonly arts and crafts features. For example, these supports on the arms to make sure that the arm doesn't break and fold over, something that you might not see in manufactured furniture. Or the use of an adjustable back. Uh, many of these can adjust, allowing for some element of reclining. And the use of quarter sawn oak gives it this tiger stripe sense that is beautifying the surface. So these are often very stunning pieces, not always with tapestry, sometimes as is here with plain leather that just fits the surface. But I bring this up because we're going to come across the Morris chair again.